Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Madam Architect Presents Women Who Shape Our World. We are delighted to have you all joining us tonight at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library. My name is Allison Nellis, and I'm a supervising librarian of programming and outreach here at SNFL. Before we begin, I would like to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for making programs like this evening's conversation possible. I would also like to remind you that if you don't already have a library card, it's easy to get one by visiting any of the service desks throughout the building. And finally, I would like to encourage you to visit NYPL's website to take a look at upcoming Seven Stories Up programs just like this one. We have an excellent lineup this season featuring new nonfiction, music, and more, and we would love to join for you to join us in this space again. After tonight's program, Fran Francine Hubin will be sending copies of Make a New People Place purpose poetry. If you would like a copy, we have them for sale, but you can also check it out with your New York Public Library card. And it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Francine Hubin is a founding partner and creative director of Mikanu. Her work ranges from theaters, museums, and libraries to neighborhoods, housing, and parks. In 2014, Francine was named Women, in Architect, of, Women Architect of the Year by the Architects Journal, and in November 2015, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands presented Francine with the Culture Forwards Prize for her wide-ranging career. Francine was, was awarded honorary doctorates from the Université de Mons, Belgium in 2017 and from Utrecht University in 2016. In 2018, Francine received the BNA Kubis Award for Ouvert, the International Prize Prix de Femmes Architects in 2019 and was distinguished with the two Delphs Alumnus of the Year in 2020. In 2021, Mekanu and Francine were presented with the European Prize for Architecture. Susanna Surfman is the founder and president of Dovetail Design Strategists, the leading independent architecture selection firm. Trained as an architect at the renowned Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. Susanna's deep knowledge of the field informs her ability to advise on design, synthesize architectural concepts, and make architecture accessible to the public. And finally, we have Julia Gamolina. Um, she is dedicated to the built environment is to, and to celebrating the extraordinary people transforming it. She is the founder and editor of Madam Architect, digital magazine and media startup focused on the women that shape our world. Trained as an architect herself, and with a decade of experience across all aspects of design and business development, Julia stays engaged in professional practice as an associate principal at the Enid Architects and a visiting professor at Pratt Institute. In 2023, Julia was listed in the wallpaper USA 300, a list of the people defining America's creative landscape. Julia also received the special citation from AIANY for her work with Madam Architect. Her writing was featured in A Women's Thing, Bass Company, Metropolis Magazine, and the Architects newspaper. And she also organizes Madam Architect Presents, Madam Architect's event series where she interviews architects in the space that they designed. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Susanna, what are you most proud of in selecting McCann for this? Well, firstly, let me just say thank you, Julia, for having me. Um, uh, I think what you, Madam Architect does is absolutely extraordinary and that you not only um, celebrate female architects, but also those of us who are architects who have decided to make different kinds of contributions to the built environment, because um, really architecture takes a village and I think everybody's contribution really needs to be heard and it's a treat for me to be up here with my great friend and, and colleague um, Francine. So I'm very proud of the entire design team selection process, as well as the extraordinary outcome. In fact, coming here today to give the talk, it's just so exciting. My elevator stopped on every single stop because people were getting on and off and it's just amazing how people love this building it's really a gift a gift to the city so my firm dovetail design strategists main focus is on architect landscape architect and design team selection for a wide range of inspired and forward-looking cultural civic institutional developer and the occasional individual who's looking for world-class design excellence and the reason that i do this is because I really do think that design excellence is necessary for, for quality of life. And in fact, I think design excellence is a basic human right. And what better kind of building than a library to be able to bring design excellence to? 
I'm sure all of you are familiar with the rather tortured story of this project, um, that the library was thinking about SASB, as we call the Schwartzman Building. You'll hear a lot of acronyms tonight. Um, so SASB, I think that the library was for decades figuring out how to do the renovation, and at one point uh, was going to sell um, what was called the Mid-Manhattan Library, MML. And thankfully, they decided not to. When we were brought on board, the library had just pivoted from um, a rather ill-advised match with the great British architect, Lord Norman Foster. And um, no, no fault of his, no fault of the libraries, it was just the wrong architect for the wrong project. Um, and we were brought on board, and the library had also, at that point, decided that they were going to roll in the Mid-Manhattan Library. I think Lord Foster was only looking at, at, at SASB. So they decided to roll in uh, uh, the Mid-Manhattan Library, so, which was a brilliant move, because they were both the, the main research branch as well as the main circulation branch. Um, and so when we were told that, when we were engaged, you know, we realized it was a campus, it was about connections, it was about transparency, it was about accessibility and inclusivity before everyone was talking about that. They were now big buzzwords. And so we knew right away um, what kind of architects the library should be looking at. We pushed the library to think globally. Um, we really wanted them to, to, to make sure that we, you know, uh, looked at every single possible architect that, that was responsible for this. Um, and in fact, we asked the right questions. I took a look when I knew we were going to be talking. I still have um, uh, Makanu and BB's um, proposals in my office because they were so beautiful. And um, I took a look. And in fact, in their original proposal, they did talk about many of the things that you see today. So um, they, the, the 40th Street entrance at SASB, um, that's so clever to connect the two. Um, and the, uh, the rooftop garden, um, all of that. So that was really, really, really quite fabulous. And I think probably um, two other things that I'm really, really proud of is that Dovetail manages to get our projects built um, all over the country and around the world. And, and this is a city where it's not easy to get things built. And, and the library happened really, really quickly, largely due to the fabulous senior leadership, the devoted and dedicated trustees, but also because we brought consensus to the decision making. We worked very closely with that group um, to make sure that everybody was on the same page. And finally, I'm most proud that it was actually built and designed by two of the greatest women architects, I think, in the world today, Francine and Liz Lieber at BBB. For those that you all know BBB, but it's Bayer Blender Bell, obviously in collaboration with Mekinu. Um, so Susanna, let's go back to the beginning of the selection process. So you mentioned that a lot of the things that we see here today were in the proposal and actually the proposal for, um, for this library, which was amazing. Um, so tell us more about why Mekinu. So we were engaged in 2014, and we knew right away that this was really not the right project for a design competition. It was too complex. It needed a team that could deal with two very different buildings. They're a similar time period. I believe um, SASB is, was finished in 1911, but it's this amazing Beaux-Arts gem. And this building was originally, um, I think it was finished in 1915, and it was originally a, a department store. It had not been touched since the 70s. I don't know if any of you had been here, but um, had this horrific fluorescent lighting and escalators, and it was just a the total, yeah. Yeah, it was a total, total mess. Um, so we knew that, that, that a design competition wasn't the way to go. Um, we wanted the senior leadership and the trustees of the library to be able to make this decision based on vision, experience, and chemistry. Um, this was a project where the team was going to be working together for, you know, five to seven years. So, you know, it's like a short-term marriage. Everybody really needed to, to like everybody. Um, so Dogtail runs a very bespoke request for qualifications, followed by a request for proposal, followed by an interview process, um, which we ran for, for them. And it was an invited long list, we call it. Um, and Dovetail crafted that, and there were 24 firms on it. Um, I travel all over the world. I like to think I know all architects. I don't. But um, I, I'm very familiar with the, the architecture ecology. And it was a tremendous um, uh, long list, which we then pared down to eight. Um, and in fact, actually, I remember we also, Dovetail likes to ask a thought question, whether we're running a design competition or another kind of process. So um, I think for that, we asked what makes a great public library for today and tomorrow. And 
Makanu and, and Bayer Blinderville hit it out of the park. They said, you know, the libraries are cathedrals for our time and the people's palace. And, um, you know, we were just blown away from the get go. We pared that down from eight to four and then to two. Um, and there were interviews. And I also um, choreographed for, for the senior leadership and the trustees of the library tours um, from our vast network of different projects um, around the UK, Netherlands and the states for them to go and see existing projects. And, and, and Makane was not on their radar at that point either. Um, so um, yeah, and the rest is history. <laughs> It's a, for those of us who have been through um, kind of submission processes, it's a long process, but it really does result, I think, in a really good fit, um, obviously, as is amplified here. So Francine, what were the goals that the New York Public Library came to you with? And then what was your, I don't want to say interpretation of them necessarily, but um, how did you meet and then add on to what they were looking for? I think um, they really, had, they were talking about the Mid-Manhattan campus. So bringing together the research library, the circulating library, and even the other one I said, the civil, the science, industry, and business library. I even wanted to add Brian Park to it and even a little pocket park behind here. A lot of people who have been working in this building even didn't know there was a pocket park behind their facade. So that was for me very important to bring that all together in a kind of logic way. And also, as I told already in the beginning, also bringing them more linked to each other. This building, in a way, is inspired by the other building. But also the learning of the, uh, the yeah, your lifelong learning. Imagine that a kid, a father with a kid, comes in in this building. They go to the children's library, or and then they become teenagers, or they have maybe brothers or sisters, and they also want to come here, and then they make the next step. That's why I really want to make the Fourth Street entrance. That it's very easy to make this stepping stone going to that library also maybe you also want to educate and that was also very important they have an enormous collection over there also to tell people very simple no books go out of that building and the books go circulate in this building to keep it very simple but you also want to have this thing that hey maybe they want you also need young researchers because you want also the collection that's in that building you want it to be visible you want it to be used you want to display it so also this learning of I get also people to go into that building that was very important for us so to get a kind of uh, uh, campus idea altogether and also but I think also what we did by making that fourth 40th street entrance was for me also very important to get the feeling that the uh, Bryan Park is going all around uh, the buildings because in a way Bryan Park or what I call Bryan Park but go was very much more on three sides and not on the 40 40 strides so now it's more and we, we made this, I did already use the 40th Street entrance. It's nice that we made all that public space there. I think a lot of people will think, hey, uh, that we didn't do anything over there, but we did a lot. <laughs> but it's very subtle. I love hearing this about Bryant Park because uh, when I first came to New York and was working my first job in architecture, I went to Bryant Park um, during my lunch break to read all of my career books and uh, you know, advice on what to do, what to do next. So it's a very special spot for me, which is why I'm excited we're here today. Um, there's a lot of elements in this project that are really exemplary. First of all, the terrace is accessible to the public. Um, I think it's the only one or something in Midtown that's uh, accessible to the public in this way. Um, I love that we're, you know, you have adapted an existing building, which actually I'm very proud of our series so far with Madam Architect, all of our projects that we've shown. I think it's a little bit the nature of being in New York, but also just something that's important to us is working with what's existing, especially given conversations around climate change, you know, all this. Um, so there's a lot of really exemplary things here. Um, everything's fully ADA compliant, etc. So talk to me about longevity in mind, you know, both for the library, but also for your work at large when we talk about resilience, um, you know, climate adaptation. What did you do here and what's important? I think what, of course, what is important uh, with all the elements we did in this building was creating this, what I call the wizard hat, with the outdoor space above, uh, along it. Also, what is it was important, maybe you experienced, but you're sitting on almost on foam, I want to say. We did elevate this floor because we wanted people to look over the parapet that you could look back to the research library, to SESB, what we call it, the Stephen A. Schwarzman building. That was very important. Of course, we did also all uh, make it more sustainable in mechanical equipment. I say you can learn a little bit from the Netherlands and Europe to make that a little <laughs> bit more sustainable. But, but I think what is maybe most important 
that the whole design is based on almost timeless values. If you see the whole interior of this building um, and the materials we did use and we selected together, had the terrazzo, the travatin, the long tables that are very much inspired by the, the uh, Rosemain reading room. We did design the chairs and I, I think uh, uh, making the long room with the stacks that are accessible is a kind of reflection on uh, um, the research library. I think the whole building, I feel it has a timeless beauty and very strong, it feels very healthy. We opened up the windows to this pocket park, but most of the people didn't know that it existed. I think the whole build, building feels timeless, beautiful and, and good. Uh, so this, for me, this sustainability is also not only the energy bill, <laughs> But it's also very much the um, yeah these timeless values. I think these are for me very important. Fantastic. And Susanna, for you, um, you know, you've been doing what you're doing for a long time. How has the how has your selection criteria evolved and changed, or maybe it hasn't? But um, just everything that we're talking about in the industry now, and that's important for the world. Like, how do you fold that in? Before I answer that, can I just make one comment about Francine's work on on the building? Of course, um, because. I think it's so worth noting that um, that not only did you transform this building and make it three times the size I ever thought it could possibly be when being in it before, but there's so many moves that Makano makes that are so subtle but so powerful. The fact that you don't actually um, check in at the front desk until you walk through the entire building um, is so incredibly important in making it accessible and inclusive and people not being intimidated and bringing people in. I mean, there's so many, so many things. And because I know there's a lot of architects out there, I think it's just interesting knowing a little bit about Francine's process, which is that you spend an awful lot of time um, with the users. I know that certainly for the proposal, you actually came to New York and you wrote us this whole, 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 whole letter from New York. And she camped out with a team of hers at the hotel across from the library and was stalking us. But no. <laughs> No, no, she really was, was stalking the users of the library um, to sort of understand. So I think that's like such an interesting way of going about, about architecture. But to answer your question, um, we're always looking for ways that we can elevate a project. How can we bring it to the next level? Um, with design, with, 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 with dovetail design strategists, design excellence is a given, even if it's a design competition and we don't know who's going to be entering. Um, I, there, there's no way it's not going to have that as a given. And I have to say in today's world, um, sustainability also is a given because there's no architecture firm out there that is not thinking about that, then they're not, not worth looking at. Um, but so for us, in addition to climate change mitigation, we're really trying to move the needle on, on, on social justice. And how can we push architects and push clients to think about ways that architecture can promote equity? Um, I think that museums are in the same place that libraries were 10 years ago when we were looking for, for, for an architect for this project. You know, everyone's talking about how to make museums relevant and how to turn them inside out. And a recent project that we just completed for the Portland Museum of Art up in Maine, they're doing a $100 million expansion to their, um, to their museum. Um, we actually they ran an open international design competition for that. But that, for that, our thought question was in what way can a museum's architecture promote equity? And the responses were extraordinary. And we also, because we're very interested in putting together teams, um, I think for this particular project, we actually had the long list for both the design architect and the architect of record, which is probably how you came to, to, to buy Blinder Bell, because we had put them on that list. Um, but just back to Portland for a minute, for that, we made an ask, which um, we wanted all the architects to team up with accessibility and inclusivity consultants. And there was this whole kerfuffle. You know, there was a lot of pushback. What do you mean? We don't know one. And, and, and all of them managed to find we got amazing results. And now we're seeing that lots of cultural projects that are not dovetail projects are really looking for that sort of expertise, because both libraries and museums are now really interested in making people feel not that they're welcome, but that they belong. Thank you. So we're going to zoom out a little bit um, and talk about both of your practices at large. Um, Francine, so you founded Bicano with four partners. Um, you've seen it through its evolution um, these past, you know, you, and you've really transformed 
uh, it into what it is today. So what were you looking to do in starting your own practice? You know, I feel like people that start their own practices really want to change something about the way architecture is made, the industry. So what was that for you? Maybe to tell you, I was still a student. We did a competition. There were no competitions at, the, at that time. And uh, I, I f still had to finish university. So with two other students from the same year, we said, let's do this competition. At the end, we won. So there was not a kind of uh, vision that we wanted to have our own office or something like that. I even I had already this project before I had time to finish the university or the school. Uh, but I think what's and also that was in the 80s and you have to realize and that's really different from now. There were not that many. It was an economic crisis. There were not that many interesting offices, but it's totally different from nowadays. Uh, but I think what I always wanted to do is change. For instance, where, and that's also in the book, uh, that at that time, um, affordable housing was a big issue and um, urban renewal uh, and how we could um, help to change that and give examples. Uh, and after that, so I did many other things. Then I thought, okay, then I've done this. I know how to do that. And then I thought, hey, public realm is really horrible. Uh, and it's, so I started to do public realm and then I thought, then we did realize projects for that. And then I thought, hey, schools, they're not good. So I started to come up with ideas about how to do other schools. So, and then we did universities and then libraries. And now we're really into also in museum because like, as you just said, um, libraries had to change, but also museum have to, have to change. And I even was also at a certain moment that I thought there's totally no vision on mobility as part of daily life. So I even became a professor in this. So I try to answer and to be visionary about things that the society needs. So I always keep on changing, doing things to make change. But also always what I think or what we think or what society needs as a new vision for certain issues. What's the next thing that we need? I know you said libraries <laughs> and then museums. So what's the next thing? Can you give us a sneak peek? Um, I think um, is even on a bigger scale to think on a bigger scale if you think about uh, also about climate change uh, res uh, resiliency is also uh, what we do also in the netherlands to make again plans for bigger parts of city including um, uh, what to do with the water management but also including that a lot of neighborhoods that are poor often have bad um, uh, mobility connections or we also try to think in about affordable housing but to bring it all together because what I learned, especially also in my own country, we used to have good leadership, also political leadership and good uh, urban planning leadership. But it's not there anymore. People just do plot by plot. So I now, and I, oh, I'm also good in the big scale. <laughs> so I'm now also doing a lot of, um, I still do museums and libraries, etc. But And of course we have a whole office, but I'm also interested in this bigger scale and to bring all these things together and help to solve them. And I also, yeah, maybe this is too theoretical for you, but we should not wait for the politicians or for leadership. We should also collaborate in a different way to do urban planning skill and uh, working together with universities or with schools or with uh, housing companies or um, even um, the business people, the, the companies, you know, so we, we, we make plans with them all together. And of course they need our visionary leadership but like talking to them and then come up with plans. And to, until now, it's very successful. The way to do it in an other way. When I thought you, what I thought you were going to say when you said it's a bigger scale, I thought you were going to start talking about designing for space and uh, living on Mars. No, I, I, I stay, I just stay with <laughs> my kept feet it very in the practical. Clay. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, so Susanna, you've carved out a super interesting niche for yourself in the industry. I don't know any sort of peer to dovetail. I think you kind of have, you know, you, you, you are maybe one of the only ones that do what you do. So how did you arrive at this focus from your architectural training? Well, so it's an interesting story. Um, I lived in London for 10 years. I was a student at the Architectural Association where I trained as an architect. And my final year um, there, I was commissioned to write a book on contemporary architecture in Chicago. And I was sent to Chicago for four months and I spent the entire time marching around, I think it's 228 square miles, taking the L, looking at 100 buildings all built within the last 10 years and meeting with every single architect. 
And that led to a number of other books. I've written five books on contemporary architecture. And then I taught for a while after I graduated. Um, and I did practice for a while um, with a colleague from the AA. We did interior architecture. We won some awards and we were published. And I hated every minute of it. I was you know, getting phone calls at 11 o'clock at night about people's dimmer switches. And um, I'm, a, I'm a details person, but somehow those weren't the details for me. But all along, I was also doing a lot of writing for the Wall Street Journal and, and, and other places. And all along, people were always asking me, you know, what architect for what project? And you can't just say, oh, I really like that one, or I like that one, or go look at a magazine. It really is a process. So um, I founded Dovetail. And in fact, I founded Dovetail January 2008, thinking we were going to focus on developer projects. And we had three magnificent developer projects. And of course, the economy crashed. Um, and three months later, all of those had, were completely, um, they were put on hold, but they never came back. And so we were forced to do civic, cultural, um, and institutional, um, which I think was the best thing that could have could have possibly happened. I mean, we were the ones who ran the competition for the city of New York for Urban Umbrella, the scaffolding that you see everywhere, which for me is a gift that just keeps giving. I walk out of my house and I smile. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's how it all, all sort, sort of happened. Um, and you had, you had asked, um, you know, how the firm has evolved, and you know, we've grown, and now we have a great team, and we're, and we're working all over. Um, but one of the other things I was thinking about, particularly as this is a forum for women, is that one of the way I personally, I think, I've evolved is that um, I used to think it was okay to be a mover and a shaker behind the scenes, and you sort of had to be in the know about 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 dovetail. Um, but in fact, when I walk into places like this, where I realize this building would not be this building. Um, you know, there were many, many people involved, but 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 if Dovetail hadn't been, if the library hadn't had the foresight to hire Dovetail to run the process and 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 to bring you know these architects to their radar, um, this building would not be the build this building. So um, you know, I I think the way that I've evolved is that that really you know every single part of the the building journey needs proper proper attrib attribution, credit, and 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 recognition. Yeah, I mean, I was just talking to someone about um, looking at kind of the credits at the end of a film, and there's literally thousands of people listed, and I'm sure there's thousands of people that are involved in architectural projects, but the lists aren't quite as long. Um, sometimes we're lucky if they're longer than one, so <laughs> uh, no, I, I completely agree. Francine, back to sort of a bigger scale of things, I mean, you now work all over the world, but I think you do bring, dare I say, sort of a Dutch sensibility to what you're doing um, everywhere, which is, is, is great. Um, so tell me about that. I mean, you mentioned also, you know, not waiting for our politicians to really implement some of the things that are important. Um, so working in different parts of the world, what have you seen in that regard or how can different people do it in different places? Um, maybe important to mention that also that I made this book. It's I really try to observe people, place, purpose and, and, and poetry. So because sometimes projects are very much like uh, Susan said, very purpose driven. And of course, the purpose is important, and Excel sheets uh, should also be <laughs> work or whatever. Uh, so I, I really try, and, and I, I, also to be honest, I like traveling. So to observe, so I, I, we work all over the world, but not, uh, you know, we, 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 are, we are working on the East Coast and we're working in Taiwan and in Europe uh, and Abu Dhabi. Um, but try to observe the place. Uh, what is the climate? What is the culture? I always look at trees, for instance, because for me, trees say something about the soil, about the culture. And I also have the idea that people are, I don't know the right word, arden in it English. What is arden? Grounding. Uh, uh, trees do ground, but people should also ground. But, but for me, our building should also be grounded. So I, I think that's a very important philosophy of Meccano. And then it's also about what we really try to do here, uh, also here, for instance, here in New York, as you know, we did also the Martin Luther King Memorial Library in Washington, D.C. But for me, Washington, D.C. is a totally different city and a population than here in New York. So you can see, yeah, we, we did it, it's two years difference, but we almost did it at the same time. They are different because, and that one belongs to Washington, and this one be, belongs to, to New York and the New Yorkers. So it's, that's, I really try, of course, and, and also my architecture, our architecture is very much about built on the census. Yeah, because at the end, you could say that all over the world, people have almost the same, you know, uh, size. Or they, you know, people they have senses. They want to look. They want the feel to sm uh, the smart uh, to um, 
it's about feeling about touching even about the smell but even that you, you know they care about your children or they care about the grandparents you know all these kind of human values to be honest they are rather similar all over the world and so we i, th I think if you can really look at the work of mecano it's, it's really this human uh, perspective i also say to my people but also my students go away from the uh, from the um, computer we're not photoshopping the world you know it's about architecture is very much about space it's about materialization of dreams you know uh, also how much because we as here and, and, uh, and david is from nypl you know how much we were could discuss about certain materials should we do it like this should this be wood should this be carpet or not or should that be travertin or not you know how do we deal with the windows that they, they have a nice rhythm or you know it's really about um uh, and that was would also be my advice to other architects or young architects also go have a connection with the building industry to understand to understand also that the building industry is changing it's also getting a more human touch how we have why we also go in prefabrication is because then the, the 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 for the workload of the workers we have to also to take care of them so this whole human touch i think it's very uh, mecano i think and that Francine isn't joking about getting to know a place. Um, you won another project, which we had run a, a process for up at Jacob's Pillow, um, which is the world oldest dance festival. And it's in the Berkshires, and they have about 30 different buildings. And if I recall, you went and camped there, um, <laughs> which we thought was just so extraordinary. You went camping there, didn't you stay yeah, I, I like, yeah, I, 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 I've been in traveling a lot. In a tent or in an RV? <laughs> I did a lot of camping. I see. I maybe I've seen more uh, of the United States than most people maybe in this room. <laughs> but I like to camp. I still like to do that in a very small one in the in the state parks in the national parks. And and uh, for me, Jacob's Pillow felt almost like a state park. So I always say I would like to camp here. What's and, your next uh, camping trip? Uh, what's my next one? I still want to go with my whole family again. But we I did it many times to. Uh, to the west but uh, but even you know to camp here in the hudson valley is really nice and what i like so much was for me a big inspiration you can take the train here from new york uh and and the the uh, along the uh, the railroad track of the hut along the hudson along the hudson it's a beautiful ride yeah, yeah. Really take cool. your tent with you and uh or, or rent a car there but it's so much fun it's so beautiful and there's a lot of cultural and historical uh, things you can visit there. It's it's really nice. Amazing, yeah. Upstate is really is really great. Um, Susanna, this is a question that I'm. Per well, I mean, I'm personally invested in all the questions, but I'm asking this for for my own reasons, which is that you know I work in business development now. I'm trained as an architect. I worked through all phases of design. Um, now I focus on how to get work. Um, which can be a little bit tough to then let it go, right? You bring an opportunity in, um, maybe you win it, whatever, and then you hand it off to the project team. So I'm, I can't imagine what it's like for you maybe in selecting the architect and then at a certain point, maybe kind of having to let go a little bit. So what do you do? How do you manage that? And it's not that hard. Um, <laughs> Um, maybe it's not the best business model, but um, so we typically um, take our clients through um, contract negotiation and then onboarding of the design team, sort of the, the kickoff kickoff meeting. Sometimes we have clients who are, who are smaller than the New York Public Library and we'll take them through a very short and sweet owner's rep selection process if they don't have a facilities department. But um, I don't seem to have any trouble staying in touch with my clients. <laughs> um, they reach out to us, um, which is quite wonderful. And in fact, Dovetail very frequently will do the largest um, capital project an institution will ever do, but we have repeat clients because they'll come back for other things or they'll have moved to a different organization or so um, I, I understand where, where, you're, where you're coming from, but um, we feel like we've set things up in such, a, such an extraordinary way. Um, you know, we come on very early and we like to be very involved in, in it's not only the architect selection group, but then then becomes the working group that will see the building through construction which is why our, our, our projects get built. I think Dovetail has now well over $1.5 billion worth of projects that are constructed. Um, and so, you know, we set things up so we're, we're happy to say, you know, no, go do it. And, and usually we have a phenomenal result, so. Maybe, maybe um, it's a sign for me if I have trouble letting go of the project and not working on it myself, maybe, maybe I should think about that, we'll see. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready yet to get back into it. Um, Let's see. So 
our readers, a lot of our readers are very early in their careers. That's why I started Madam Architect. It's meant to be, you know, um, kind of a, a resource for, for guidance. And um, it just so happened that in the way that I made it, it's also a way to highlight women and women's contributions. Um, but anyway, so I want to kind of end on a few questions of advice. Um, the first is you're both founders, you're both running your own businesses. I mean, the amount of, you know, brain power that involves and the different skills that, that involves is really vast. Of course, you have you have people and you delegate. Um, but what advice do you have for those wanting to start something of their own, be it an architecture firm or even just an initiative in the industry? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but <laughs> why do you say that? Tell us more. No, I, I think a lot of people know it's, it's also it's not easy because you asked me what was your dream. When we started, we were very, na very naive. We were just students and it just happened and it was also that zeitgeist. But I think if there's people here with an own firm, it's, uh, it's uh, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours, uh, it's in your mind. So you really, uh, and I love it, eh? so that's not, uh, uh, but we all know, and also especially for women maybe, uh, it's a tough job. Uh, because at the same time, you put your whole heart in the project, it's also a kind of emotional involvement that you have, but people can react to you. Uh, in a not so emotional or in a uh, more rational way, but it's sometimes difficult to balance. And uh, uh, so, th so that's the tough part. And I think you should really do it if you enjoy it. And there is not one way of being an architect. I did it my way or I do it my way uh, with the whole team, but there are other architects who do it in another way. And that's also, that's, I think that's great what uh, Susan is saying, this try to find the, the, the right team, bring teams together because I think what is nowadays so interesting is that there are so many different architects and architect teams um, and th that should fit to the client. Um, and I'm happy with what I'm doing for already now four decades and, and also with the whole team around me. Uh, I also try not to grow. Uh, we are 100, Marloes is here, we are 120 people. I try to be of the size of a symphony orchestra. I can deal with the whole world uh, but with that. I don't want to grow uh, because we have been big. I think I don't want it. It's fine. I can do my, uh, we, we've done great work. I think I'm happy. We are still a kind of big family of Mecanos. So it's also for me the, again, also the human touch in your own office um, um, is for me very important. Um, so you should not be, I, I don't want to be money driven. Let, let's see that. When you said earlier about, you know, there's many ways to be an architect. I do it my way. What do you mean by that? What is your way? Um, <laughs> what is my way? It's also kind of uh, it's people, place, purpose, and don't forget about the poetry. So, I, and, and it's also sometimes very intuitive, and also uh, bringing together. That's why I call also Mecano the symphony orchestra. It's like bringing you know, together. You make the music, and sometimes you need a big team. Sometimes you do it with two or three people. Sometimes there are so th this this yeah, we're dancing together, and. Um, yeah, that makes it so, yeah, it makes me happy. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, sometimes there's also sometimes a little bit of stress, but you know, all overall, I'm extremely happy um, how we, we, we do, we've been doing it in, a, I think, a rather unique way. Yeah. Well, it shows in the work. You know, I think that um, architecture is on elephant time. Architecture happens so, so slowly. Um, and in a funny sort of way, I think it's easier when you're starting out because you don't know what you don't know. Um, but it's a really a long game and, you know, time, perseverance and tenacity will get you everywhere. Um, Susanna, for you also, there's, you know, so many young firms, there's so many firms now, we have social media, which makes it a lot easier for people to be kind of their own PR people. Um, there's, there's a lot more opportunity, I think, now than there was before. But also that means that it's a pretty crowded market. There's a lot of young firms, there's a lot of firms, period. So for those that are starting their own firms or for people that are chasing new work, what's your advice to them? How do you stand out in this loud, busy place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Julia. Um, I think it's really important that firms understand who they are, who their strengths are, who their competitors are, and carefully consider um, 
what jobs you go after. Are they appropriate for your firm? Do you think you're going to get it? I mean, after all, it's a business decision to enter uh, either a competition or, or even an invited RFQ, RFP. You know, it's time, time and money. So um, you have to understand, you know, what does your firm bring to the table? Um, and that said, then um, my biggest piece of advice to all architects, all new emerging Pritzker Prize winners, like, think about what your client wants. Um, you know, architecture school is a place where you're taught to think about what you want. Um, but you really, like, it's a service industry. Um, it is an art, but it is a service industry. And I think actually that's one incredible thing that, that, that Francine and her team do is really understand what your client needs and what the user needs and, um, and see how you can push them even further. There's, there's two things that I think of. First of all, at any ad, we talk a lot about um, not only not can we do this project when we see an opportunity, it's not just about can we do this, do we have the experience to do it, but it's about can we win it, you know, given the opportunity, the competition, et cetera, all these factors. Um, so I think that's really important for people to think about. It was really interesting because we work across all sectors. And so I will see certain firms that I think are fabulous for certain things. They'll enter everything. And I just think, you know, if you just didn't do that, <laughs> it would be better. Yeah, that's one thing. But another thing I actually meant to ask you earlier was, um, you know, as architects, you know, we have a kind of a list of questions maybe that we like to ask the client once we're hired to kick off the process. What do you ask a client that hires you? What are some of the first questions you ask an institution when they bring you on to help them select an architect? So that's another 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 great question. Um, so we do a lot of uh, front end work. We work in three phases, um, discovery, development, and execution. And our discovery phase is really getting to know and understanding the nuances of an organization. And cultural organizations in particular, everyone is completely different. And the, the trustees are completely different and every trustee has their own agendas. Um, so there's a lot of getting to know them. Um, we spend a lot of time um, with that sort of client aligning aspiration with budget. Um, uh, you know, typically they'll come with a very big wish list and we'll say, you know, that's not happening. Um, so, uh, and we like to do that, you know, well before we reach out, out, out to the architects. So um, we do a lot of, of groundwork, you know, making sure that they, there's a clear program. Um, I always tell clients that, you know, architects aren't like doctors. They're not there to diagnose your problem. Um, you have to tell them what your problem is, and then they can solve it, um, which sometimes comes as a surprise to, to, to clients who think that the architect is going to tell them, you know, what their problem is, and it doesn't really work that way. Um, so we try and set things up, um, everything from who the decision makers are um, to making sure there's been ample community engagement and permitting and zoning and all of that. I mean, we do a lot of front end work with our clients to make sure we're all on the same page. Actually, one last thing I want to ask before my last question, then we'll open it up is we talked about the selection of Mechanu. Um, tell me about the selection of BBB and that matchmaking. So I don't know the backstory from I'd like to hear it from Francine. But for us, um, we created two um, we were very clear that this project was very complex um, and that it needed not only what we thought the best way to frame it and the best way to move it forward was that even if it was a local New York architect who was going to do it, there should be a design lead and then a local architect of record or what's called an executive architect. So when we created the long list of 24 design architects, we also created what we called a sample list of pre-vetted um, architects of record, clients, uh, architects I had known for, for many, many years, some of the library knew, and we had put Bayer Blinder Bell on that list. And we had told the invited architects, this is who we're looking at, this is the quality, this is the expertise, this is the kind of um, historic preservation um, experience that we're looking for. And in fact, I go, I go quite far and, and I know who I want to be the lead partner. And I, we had done a lot of work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art and um, Bayer Blinder Bell had been selected through our list there, and I knew Liz Lieber, and I just knew she would be fantastic for this project. So, you know, we had gone as far as that, but we told the architects on the list, here are five architects of record we think would be fabulous. You can team up with one, um, you can bring in somebody that you want, um, but this is who we're really thinking about. Um, and we also said um, that the architects of record could be on more than one team, and I think Liz will never forgive me because I think they were on multiple teams. But, um, but I don't know how then um, Francine and, and Liz must have made a phone call. Um, indeed, as you said, there was a list of three, yeah, four, I don't yeah, know yeah. anymore, there was a list of, sure, uh, of 
architects of record, but with this also kind of uh, restoration uh, aspect, I think that was important. Uh, and away I, I had a call with said, Jerry, you're sitting here, you said you should take a list. <laughs> so he told me. Um, and uh, so and it, that, was a, it was a dream team. We and then I called program. Liz and I, and I, I as I told you, I, 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 I was often in New York. So I, we also became a team. But we also, to be honest, we kept some distance because Liz or BBB was in more teams. So we really did our own thing. And until even at the end, there was still, I think, two left over. Yeah. But they were in both teams. So we, we kept it. Uh, the real collaboration started, After. and of course there was already friendship, but the real co collaboration started uh, after that, because it was a little bit confusing for us. But I think it, but in a way, I also want to make a big compliment to NYPL and you, is that you make that clear, because sometimes, and we were also somewhere for another um, selection, then you call people and then they are, that you then you, it's very confusing also for the architects and the architect of record want to do it themselves or don't want to be in it or it's in I think it was a, a very strategic for you to make a list of uh, these three four or five architects of records and the design uh, teams I think it was I, I, I really want to make a big compliment on the whole selection process it was, it was very well done and I think it took you almost nine months or something like that it was not an, a quick thing I think it was, it was, we were working on the project for a few months before, but I think it was about eight months. Um, but it was due diligence. I mean, yeah, and they also, I think for the last two, when we were the last two, they came to the Netherlands. I think maybe they also went to Birmingham. Uh, we were work, work, working already in, uh, in Washington. I, so I remember you came to, I had to give a lecture in Washington. So suddenly there was the NYPL in the room. <laughs> and uh, so I think you really took your time uh, because there was some history before us and there was uh, they didn't want to repeat that what i could imagine but i think i think also I, what i said also when we had the opening what was still during covid time i also want to mention mention because this is madame architect it was really a, a, a female led team eh, from us from liz and from bbb but also for nypl with iris with Riza, uh, jennifer who passed away so it, it was really we were really uh, women power all together, isn't it? It's, uh, that's how we were proud of each other. Nice, yes. <laughs> Give it up. Thank you. I know, I really wish that Liz could have joined us tonight, but there was a conflict. Um, yeah. So my last question. Gary is here, I think. Gary is here. Where's Gary? Yeah, Where's yeah, Gary oh, oh Gary, Gary. Yeah, hi, yeah. Gary. <laughs> we know Gary. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. So my last question, again, our audience is very early in their careers. Um, so what do you say to those that are starting in this crazy world of ours, starting their careers, and especially starting today, when again, just a lot of information out there, a lot of ways to reach people, but also again, very, very crowded? I think what is, for me, the big difference when I started, as I told you, there were almost no architectures offices, it wasn't, but I think there are so many interesting offices at this moment. So first, learn. <laughs> And a work, you can even make step over. Yeah, I, I learned some there in this office, and then to another office. If you really want to make the step to make your own firm, I first say don't do it. But if you really want to do that for your passion or whatever, or your ego or whatever, but but it's very. You, there, there are so many interesting different. Uh, so that I think we live in a very interesting time. There are enormous challenges uh, in the world. Um, and we have to address them, we as architects. So it's really, I totally agree. We have to be visionary, but also serving society. That's really my philosophy. And I, I think you also explained it. Uh, so, and you can do, you can find your own way in that. And I think that's so interesting uh, of nowadays times. And it's hard work, it's often underpaid, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you really love it, it's, it's great. So you should compare it a little bit to musicians and artists, you know. Uh, uh, what we are doing. I think yeah. it's so funny, Francine, that you say there were so few Dutch firms because there's so many fabulous Dutch firms now. Yeah, so no, there is, but at that time, not. Yeah. No, 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 there is also yeah. in, the, in the Netherlands, are amazing, yeah. Yeah. but also in the yeah. United States yeah. and in the Netherlands, or yeah. there are many interesting offices. And they are different, you know, and, and that's good. Yeah, we imagine that we should then we become Russia or China for, uh, many years ago. But they, no, it's so interesting that you also, as um, clients, you can really make selection. You can really make your choices. Yeah. 
um, I think I would say the same thing. I think, you know, it's a lot of hard work and you have to love the details of what you do. Um, and I think you should always think big. I think our world is in a terrible place right now and needs people who are really interested in, in making change. And architecture is a phenomenal way to make change. What a great note to end on. Thank you both so much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So I think, do we have some time for audience questions? Great, any questions? Oh, I see one over Hello, here in the where? front. Oh, I have, yeah. Oh, Mike is coming to you on your right. Hi, is this on? It's on, and introduce well, yourself, all, please. Yes, I'm Vivian Lee, um, and uh, I have great admiration for what Fen Singh has done, and Susanna, and this amazing, amazing library. So I was recently in Tainan, and I visited the Tainan Library that you did, fencing. Stunning. It is one of the places, if you ever go to Taiwan, besides the good food, you have to visit Tainan. Yeah. They also have very good food in Tainan. But I, one thing I noticed is that at the, the children's floor, the way you designed it, how thoughtful it was to really think about the users in their scale. But also the ability to, for them to realize how important it is to have that institution, to have that place for them to gather and to learn. With the technology, think about the future generation, how we are using a lot more technology. Do people get, use books and do they come to the library? What the purpose is? What is your thought about the future generation in using and keeping the library as a cathedral of learning? It's it's very interesting that you mentioned the Tainan Library. You should all go anyway. You should go to Taiwan because we did amazing work in Taiwan, the the railway station and the Wei Wuying Center of the Arts. But what is so interesting, especially if you look at libraries and children, it's totally different in every country. The culture in Tainan, it's you you know, the kids put off the shoes and uh, they go there. For instance, in the in the Netherlands, we put children next to. Um, the, not the elderly, but like next to the cafe and that the parents can sit there and see, hey, the kids are over there. No way in the UK or the US. Uh, what I think is also very interesting, what we did in the, that should not happen here, but in Tainan is that cooking and food is very much part of the new libraries. So we also have cooking classes there. We have uh, kitchens uh, that you have classroom with uh, cooking facilities. We created there, we put the kids like here in the lower ground floor. I always like to create lower ground floors, don't call them basements. Eh? But with an outdoor space that the kids don't run away. Um, in China, for instance, the collection um, of comics is very important. Um, maybe also to mention what when I started to do this library, I was not just looking at the buildings, but also to the collection. Because of a lot of architects think that, oh, um, libraries are about books and you just stack them all the way. No, it's about collections. It's about people. How to bring people in co in context in connection with the collection, and um, can happen with books. But it's really thinking. And also, I think what we did in this library, every floor is different. The 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 the, the, the circulating collection is on floor two. I don't know if you've already visited the whole building. Is on floor two, three, and four. Five and six is more learning, and then from learning you can go to in business, and that's happening on the fifth floor. And then this is more about event space. In the original brief, the event space or this kind of room was in the basement. Uh, do you remember? So it's like also, and we also don't create one atmosphere. You also have to be aware, had to be inclusive, that you also create different atmospheres. You, there is also a lot of people that are even shy to go into a library. They feel ashamed that they don't speak the language. I, I was in the elevator with people with flyers, how to learn English. And they go to classes here on the floor we know here we created that a more kind of homey feeling. So to have these different atmospheres, I think that was really the discussion we had, uh, was extremely important. And also not to, uh, how to, to make little people little, to impress them too much, you know, it should be very friendly. I remember Francine that in your proposal, you had said you thought the biggest challenge was where to put the teens. Yeah. And at the end, we did put the teens in the lower ground floor next to the children, but we really divided and we gave them all their own stair. If you've seen the wooden stair, because teenagers don't want to sit next to kids. Eh? There have it. So, but uh, at the same time, we are, of course, this is a more compact building than the one, for instance, in Washington. So the space in between, what is it, is a big uh, kind of multifunctional space, can be used after school 
classes, so after three for the teenagers, and uh, and and more uh, uh, storytelling, etc. What happens in different times can be used by them. So we were really, and but it also divides the two at different atmospheres, so that you don't mix up kids with teenagers. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more. Anybody? Hello. Okay. Chris, thank you so much. This is so inspiring and so like energizing. And as a young person who's um, very much interested in urban planning and design and architecture, this introduce has been... yourself. Oh, hello, uh, Roxanne. My name is Roxanne. Um, yeah, I I've met Julie before, and she's you're so inspiring. So thank you. Um, specifically, my question slash comment. So last last week or two weeks ago, I'm in the Women in Architecture Committee at the AIA Center for Architecture. And for the International Women's Day celebration, we had um, Dr. Sharon Egreda Sutton who spoke, and she has, uh, it made me think about your comment about music and the connection between music and architecture, because she holds like five different degrees in psychology, music, architecture, etc. cetera. Um, and I was asking her, how do you see kind of your interdisciplinary uh, experience like coming together in architecture? And she said that music and architecture, it's all about collaboration, it's all about connection. Um, and as someone who practices music too, I, I just resonate a lot with your analogy to music and the symphony of, um, yeah, just everything from teams to like the user needs and yeah. So And don't forget Anyways. the rhythm. <laughs> yes, the rhythm is the rhythm. also part of that, yes. Well, thank you very much again, thank yeah. you. Fantastic, thank you all so much for coming. This is a wonderful turnout and another hand for Francine and Susanna, thank you.